Now then, let's get going. Oh, hello there. Don't you worry, we'll get to your video about video games. But first of all, let's take a little brief moment to appreciate the fact that Deadly Premonition is now on Switch and it's all thanks to me. I'm the one who demanded that the, the game industry put dead, and then it's the entire game industry that's in on it. And I demanded that they put Deadly Premonition on Switch, and I gave them 24 hours to comply. And I said that 24 hours before they announced it. So definitely, what's going on here? And there's no other reason for it. I promise. Definitely, what's going on here is that the game industry acquiesces to my demands. So what am I going to do with this newfound power? Hmm. I'm going to get the rights to Rise of the Robots and make my own Rise of the Robots game. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to call it Rise of the Robots 2. Yeah. Okay, I may have had an inkling that the announcement was coming. I may have. But I do get credit for putting Aliens vs Predator on the Capcom home console. Huh? I did that and they even said, look, there's evidence that they said it. So again, I want my Rise of the Robots 2. That's not me being cute. That's not a joke. It's one of three fighting games I've ever played. So I definitely want it. Who's got the rights to that? Give me the rights to that. And then, of course, there was the big news. This one I did not anticipate. I did not expect Deadly Premonition 2 to be coming out. And all I've got to say about that is, and let me just compose myself here. Developer Chuckle Fish recently came under fire for what's alleged to be massively unethical behaviour by former developers who claim they worked for the company at a very young age without any monetary compensation. The company, famous for developing Starbound and publishing titles like Stardew Valley, appears to be a little less Chuckle Fish and a little more Fuckle Fish. Huh? Or Chuckle Fuck. Or Chuckle Piss. I'd say cucklefish, but I'm not an incel. The controversy was kicked off by writer Damon Reese, who took to Twitter to describe how they, at the young age of 16, poured tons of free labour into the critically acclaimed Starbound, which has gone on to shift over 2.5 million copies. I worked hundreds of hours and wasn't paid a single cent for it, while the company made unbelievable amounts of money off my labour and that of around a dozen other unpaid workers, they claimed. A couple of them ended up working at the company, it doesn't mean they weren't exploited too. Reese's comments found strong support from others in the industry. Artist and designer Ro Watson backed up the writer's claims, saying, Those who are passionate and wanted to help with the game were given a standard contributor contract and told it was industry standard. According to Watson, the contract made sure contributors had no official affiliation with Chucklefish, but nonetheless waived all rights to their work without expectation of pay. This contract was meant to be for modders and fans who donated their work, but this was not how they were used in this particular case. Instead, allegedly, these contributors were, and I quote, under immense pressure to meet deadlines and that payment was never explicitly guaranteed, it was never written off and strongly implied. Other developers and members of the community at large have joined in condemning Chucklefish for abusing a position of power, exploiting young and less business savvy developers and generally being a bit of a shit. Composer Clark Powell said he was subjected to a foul-mouthed screed about how entitled he was from Starbound's director for expecting financial compensation for his music, and said that workers had been promised pay, but instead had their love for the industry exploited and abused. By now, legendary composer and Undertale developer Toby Fox supported Howell's story and said his own contributions weren't included in the game because he wasn't in the company's IRC channel enough. As for Chucklefish, it has not denied that it benefited from hundreds of hours of free labour, but it doesn't see how this makes the company look bad. 
In a statement released to press after the story broke, the company said, We're aware and saddened by the current allegations against Chucklefish regarding Starbound's early development. During this time, both the core crew and community contributors were collaborating via a chat room and dedicated their time for free. Community contributors were under no obligation to create content, work to deadlines, or put in any particular number of hours. Mm-hmm. Hmm. The claim of no deadlines was combated by Damon Reese, who shot back with, Deadlines were absolutely in place, if not formal, then definitely heavily implied. Ah uh, yes, the implication. This is a big part of what we here at the Jimquisition call the gun to head defense. This defense is often used to justify abusive work practices, such as the intense crunch periods of unpaid overtime that riddle the industry. Many companies love to defend their exploitation of workers by saying that no one was forced to do anything, they all chose to do it. Nobody, as the famous phrase goes, had a gun to their head. But this ignores the power dynamics at play. The companies are calling the shots, holding people's careers, livelihoods, and future expectations in their hands. So companies don't need explicit deadlines, they don't need to put guns to people's heads, they just need to imply that they need a certain thing done by a certain date, and let that implicit expectation dangle over people's heads. Many developers I've interacted with over the years have been terrified of speaking out, usually doing so under condition of anonymity if they do at all, because they fear the the power and influence of companies even if they don't work there anymore, worried about their reputations and ability to find work if they dare speak out against abusive employers. When Epic Games came under fire for allegations of ridiculous crunch periods, a big part of those allegations involved workers who were told they had unlimited time off. They could always take time off, except they were consistently guilted into never taking that time off because their obscene workloads would invariably fall onto the shoulders of others and nobody wanted to be the person to foist that workload off. In addition to that, some workers who did put their foot down and had strict rules about when they would and wouldn't work were fired because the deadlines they had couldn't be met without working ridiculous hours. Sources say they simply knew that if they didn't work the hours to meet the deadlines as contractors, they just wouldn't be coming back and new disposable bodies would be brought in. No explicit threats needed, not when you have the implication. Okay, now that was an implication, right? That was definitely the implication. And this is what corporations love to do. They love to frame it as a choice. You're free to refuse to engage with crunch, but if you don't meet your deadlines, you're fired. But it's still your choice. It's your choice. If there's one thing a corporation loves to do, it's to make people feel like they're choosing to participate in their own oppression. It's a classic manipulation tactic. Make the mark think, it's their decision. You'll notice that what the game industry says to justify coercing its workers into long, abusive crunch periods is pretty much the same excuse they use when they try and justify microtransactions and loot boxes and, and other predatory business models. It's optional! It's a choice! They love that. They, they need to hinge this on everything being a choice. Not their choice! to implement these structures and these environments in the first place. It's the choice of the people they're targeting to participate in it. That way, it's never their fault. I've had to put this, this squid bit on my shoulder because otherwise it messes with the microphone. Chucklefish is a renowned developer allegedly attracted inexperienced, potentially suggestible, starry-eyed people as young as 16. And if the stories are to be believed, it pressured young contributors into working mountains of time to demonstrate their passion and love for the industry. And that's something I'd really like to focus on, this idea that community contributors are there because they're passionate, and passion is its own reward. That you shouldn't expect financial compensation if you love the company and love the games and love what you're doing. If you're expecting money for your work, then you're entitled. You don't have the real true heart of a real true gamer with a real true love 
for games. While Chucklefish isn't incorrect in saying these people chose to contribute hundreds of hours of free labour, making this claim without context and without recognition for the power Chucklefish wields, when encouraging unpaid work in exchange for the sheer love of doing it, is something of an abdication of responsibility. So anyway, this whole thing got me thinking about passion, because that comes up a lot when these sort of topics arise. Asha, are you a passionate man? Well, not particularly, I'm a but I am man enough. On the surface, passion is a lovely little word. Who doesn't want to be passionate about the things they do? Who doesn't want to love that? Caring deeply for one's work is terrific. I remember being passionate once, a long, long time ago. It was nice, I think. But passion can also be one of the most coercive words in the English language. Used as it all too often is to coerce people into working for little or no pay, sidelining their personal lives and otherwise breaking their backs to prove they have the heart and willpower to deserve a spot in the industry. In short, passion has become a bullshit word used in place of compensation or fair treatment. And if any boss tries to fob you off with it, or make you feel guilty for not being passionate enough because you expect to not be treated like a disposable body, you are well within your rights under the American Constitution of America to fling a handful of ants into their face. Professional liar Peter Molyneux has defended crunch period periods with lofty ideals before, being a big supporter of overworking developers for nonsense reasons. I am a big believer in crunch, he once said. Uh, crunch is energy, and that's what you need, is you need that energy in people, and you do need to all come together. There's this wonderful thing that happens to human beings when they're, uh, faced with the impossible, which is that they often bring their best foot forward, and that's what you need. Uh, so I wouldn't get rid of that stuff. What? Rot. Get their ants in his face. It's a perfect example of what we're talking about, this misuse of the concept of passion to convince, connive and coerce people into hurting themselves to make money for other people. Crunch is energy. Fuck off with that shite, mate. Crunch is a vacuum of energy, sucking it out of people. If it is energy, it's energy generated at the expense of the physical and mental well-being of the employees. Now, one of the most notorious abusers of the concept of passion is Alex St. John, who believes that unless game developers are willing to sacrifice their personal lives and maintain a work-life balance skewed entirely in favour of work, they're not a true game developer. He doesn't even believe you can burn out from the stress of making video games simply because they're video games and because people sit at desks when they make them. This is despite he himself having burnt out once while working for Microsoft. Seriously, the guy's a fucking weird little monster. Way back in 2016, I went freaking off on that man for exhibiting a frankly despicable attitude. Most recently, and perhaps most controversially, DirectX co-creator Alex St. John went on a tirade to extol the virtues of crunch, claiming those who complain about it are perpetuators of victimology and wage-slave attitudes by demanding reasonable working hours and fair compensation. Making games is not a job, it's art, he claims. With that excuse, St. John argues that only the truly passionate people can make great games, and that passion can only manifest via a willingness to overwork, not expect overtime pay, and be happy that your work life and personal life is skewed excessively towards the former. Basically, work for free, or you're not a game developer. He's tapped into an old and rather trite attitude that people in creative fields should never expect compensation. That if you're not working for Walmart or in a grey office cubicle, you don't have a real job, and therefore have no right to complain about your conditions. That art itself has no value. That creativity is financially worthless. And you know what? In a world where artists aren't, say, human beings who need things like food, water, shelter and rest, that's a terrific little dream. A world where you can just create and not have to pay rent or support a family and the frogs talk and the dragons fly you into the sky. But with all due respect to Alex St. John and people who think like him, we don't live in that bullshit rose-tinted infantile fantasy land. St. John's arrogant tract makes him out to be the realist of the situation. The guy talking sense to all these whinging entitled game devs, but he's a fucking fantasist if he believes that passion is all you can live on, that passion will keep you from burning out, that passion stops you wanting a paycheck that 
reflects the hours you've put in. His view is childishly romantic and it's not fucking real. St. John advises people to hire young college level developers based on their passion for the industry, literally claiming they can be worked too hard under the premise that it's the only way they'll become seasoned. He especially believes people with Asperger's are the perfect candidate, calling them, I shit you not, the holy grail, due to what he says are limited social lives, a machine-like approach to work, and an inability to develop attitudes or even switch jobs. Mm -hmm. hmm. He famously says that coding is not work, it's a calling. He says this because it's so much easier to exploit people who do not consider what they do a job but a hobby. Many of us pour hours of our lives into hobbies without expectation of pay because it's something we elect to do with our time and of love for the activity. Our free time, by the way, which we spend doing things for us. But that is not what coding is when it's done for an actual business. That is not what game development is when it's performed for people looking to profit. If you're working for a company that expects to make money from what you create, then you should expect to make money from what you create. It's just that fucking simple, folks. It would be unfair to say that Alex St. John represents every boss in the game industry. He doesn't. He just represents those bosses in the game industry that say this kind of awful shit out loud and don't just think it. For too long, passion has been used as an excuse to get people to work long hours for little compensation or no compensation at all. One of the most recent controversies regarding unfair worker treatment involved League of Legends developer Riot Games, which has been criticised heavily for its frat boy attitude, shitty treatment of women in its employ, and expecting everyone to be heavily invested in its culture. We want passionate gamers who are talented professionals, its hiring page once read. You need conviction, passion, and horsepower to excel at Riot. And again, that is all great on a surface level. It's great to love what you do and to love video games if you're working in the game industry. It's not required, I mean I'm in games media and I literally hate every video game. But contextualised around a company with a poor reputation for worker treatment, it looks just a little like bullshit used for coercive purposes. Speak up about the way you're being exploited? You're not passionate enough. Feel you deserve more time off or more compensation or just a bit more respect? Well, that doesn't sound like a true gamer. The way passion is cynically utilised by companies occurs in games media as well. The most famous example of this is Brash Games, headed up by Paul Ryan, not that one. Brash Games was a video game review website that expected writers to contribute a certain number of articles per month with strict deadlines and a lack of editorial control. Paul Ryan, not that one, was known to alter writers' review scores without their permission or knowledge, seeming to favour serving publishers over serving his own audience. There's something about Paul Ryan's doing that, looking after established powers while ignoring the people they're supposed to represent. I don't know what it is, it's just... You know, it's just something about... Paul Ryan, not that one, paid his writers in exposure. An exposure they wouldn't even keep if they left the site as former contributors would have their byline scrubbed and their work credited to Brash alone. Yet again, it was young and easily influenced writers trading on their passion, and while exploitative snakes like Paul Ryan, not that one, aren't quite so common in games media now, I come from an era where unpaid internship was rather a done thing. I worked for free many times in my early career, worked for places where interns were contributing for little more than exposure, and really I shouldn't have, I regret all of it, but back in the mid to late 2000s, it was one of the only ways you could get anywhere. Demonstrate you have the love for the work necessary to maintain a career. Prove yourself as a loyal and dedicated writer who is happy to trade hours of your life for the exposure, for the sheer enjoyment of seeing your work published, which I did. Many of the luminaries among the game's press are likely did too. Unless it really is just me being a fool. But now that I've gone fully gym dependent, I pay anyone who contributes to my work, anyone who provides art or labour. And I don't have any unpaid interns at all. Apart from Craig. But he's a dick. Aren't you, Craig? Huh? Don't you look at me like that. And who said you could stop eating that skateboard? Don't ask me why! Just eat the skateboard! 
Do as you're told! The poison of passion is something I see a lot now in professional wrestling, where I've been working steadily for almost two years now. If you think you see the word passion overused in game development, by God! Do you want to listen to pro wrestling promoters go off? Pro wrestlers put themselves through all manner of physical pain and intense training to do what they do, and you absolutely need passion. If you're going to get slammed into canvas supported by wooden boards in front of a crowd of sometimes only 20 people. But that passion sees many wrestlers draw very little money and sometimes none at all, and nowhere is the exploitation of passion more despicable than in the WWE, where Chairman Vince McMahon is a billionaire raking in disgusting amounts of cash from wrestlers who aren't even considered employees. Instead, performing as contractors, without health benefits, without unionization, without even their basic travel arranged. Yes, WWE wrestlers, as in performers for the multi-billion dollar media empire with several international TV shows, have to sort their own fucking cars out. At least they're paid, but even then, some of the talent lower down the card are paid less than I am for this bollocks. And that just doesn't seem right, considering WWE has no off-season, they tour the world with brutal travel 24-7, and don't even get Christmas off. Pro wrestler and friend of mine O'Shea Edwards has a great approach to this. He says, Passion is great when it's a hobby, but wrestling is my business. The passion is secondary. I use wrestling to pay my bills and put food on my table. Sadly, my bank doesn't take passion checks, because if they did, I'd never have to work again. I wrestle because I'm damn good at it, and when you're good at something, never do it for free. Oh, and O'Shea Edwards is damn good at it. The industry would be wise to not sleep on that dude. Just, you know, pay the man. Passion as a concept is a lovely thing, but Katriple Capitalism has done what Katriple Capitalism does and sucks the positives out to leave behind a cynical, predatory ideal that is used as bait to lure newcomers to an industry into providing free labour. And, in case you couldn't have told from this video already, I think that's bollocks. Normally, I have an outro that wraps up my thoughts, maybe adds a little extra, but I think today's episode was so comprehensive, I've got nothing more to add, really. Uh, nothing... nothing more to add. So... I'm doing this bit here just out of, you know, respect to the format. There's nothing else I, I, I want to say today, I've got everything off my chest. Uh, what's down here? Stuff to play with, stuff to play with. Uh, oh, here's a prop, here's a fun game thing. Look, a battery. There's a battery down there for some reason. I don't know what I'm doing. Thank God for me.